This is a simplified Good Friday service for families with young children during the pandemic. It's with Father Bo of Dormition Parish in Edmonton, and it features a reading from the Bible for Young People by Zoe Kenevas and illustrated by Christos Gusides. I encourage parents, before they do this service, to watch the How to Set Up for This Service video. So we're ready to pray. It's time for us to do the usual beginning. The usual beginning is how we warm up in our prayers. So let's pray together. Blessed is our God, now and always and forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of blessings, bestower of life, come dwell within us, cleanse our souls of all that defiles us, and, O oh good one, save our souls. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now and forever and ever. Amen. Most holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us of our sins. Master, forgive us our transgressions. O Holy One, come and heal our infirmities, for your name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now and forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. The next part of our service, we're going to pray for peace and for the health and well-being of the whole entire world. It's called the Litany of Peace. So after I pray something, let's sing Lord Have Mercy together. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For peace from on high and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For peace throughout the world, for the well-being of God's holy churches, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord our God, we also pray at this time where we are sheltering from the pandemic that you come and you heal this world, comfort all those who have lost loved ones, guide all of those who are making decisions for the needs of the people, help all of us so that we can stay healthy, and for those who are already sick, Lord, heal them speedily. Hear us, O oh Lord, and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We also ask you to calm our hearts so that we can, in confidence, trust you to take care of us. Hear us, O Lord, and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We also pray for all of the other things that are going on in the world. The poor, the hungry, those who are lacking shelter, those who are in places of violence, in wars or in their homes those who are struggling in their marriages, those who are struggling with their parents, and the parents who are struggling with their children. Lord, bless all of us, hear us, and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We also pray for our moms and our dads, our brothers and sisters, 
Our pets and everyone that is around us, our grandparents, our neighbors, those who are working in the hospitals and in the grocery stores, those who are deciding things for our whole nation. Lord, you know everyone who is around us. Help and heal and take care of us all. Hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I think it would be a good time for you to mention who you would like to pray for. Maybe you have someone special in your heart that you would like to say their names. So I'm going to take a brief pause here. And if you need more time, you can always pause your video. And you French pray, mention every name that you want to pray for. Pray for your aunts, your uncles. And then when you're ready to start again, unpause and we'll sing Lord have mercy for them. For all the people that you have mentioned, Lord, hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Remembering our most holy and immaculate, most blessed and glorious Lady, the Mother of God, and ever-Virgin Mary, together with all of the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. For all glory, honor, and worship befit you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. Wisdom, let us be attentive. When we introduce the gospel on Good Friday, we're going to sing Glory Be to Your Passion, O Lord, and make a prostration. A prostration is falling before God. Glory to your passion, O Lord. Let us be attentive. After Judas betrayed Jesus, they secretly dragged Jesus, tied and bound, to Annas, the high priest. They do this in the middle of the night because they fear the people. They do not want the people to find out and cause a stir. Annas immediately begins the questioning. He is in a hurry to declare Jesus guilty. He is trying to find facts to declare him guilty. He asks about his teaching he asks about his disciples. Jesus does not answer. Ananias looks at the other high priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. They are all seated on comfortable chairs, closely following the questioning. Their faces are familiar. Jesus had seen them in the synagogue and at the altar, where he often preached. They, of course, have also seen him. With the movement of his head, Jesus clearly points towards Ananias. Ask them about my preaching, not me. I did not preach in secret. They all heard me. They can tell you. One of the officers strikes Jesus in the mouth, saying, Is this the way you speak to the high priest? Jesus only tells him, If I have said something wrong, say so. If, however, I have said that which is right, why do you strike me? Ananias' questioning resulted in nothing, certainly nothing that would prove Jesus guilty, and especially guilty enough to be sentenced to death. Therefore, Ananias sends him to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Peter sees Jesus just as the guards are taking him out of the house of Ananias. Peter's eyes fill with tears. Jesus looks so tired, so pained. You would think that the pain of the whole world had been piled upon him. A servant girl sees that Peter is moved. She asks him, Are you one of his disciples? Peter shrugs his shoulders. I do not know this man. 
Unfortunately, the servant girl does not insist. Peter rushes to go to Caiaphas' house before the gates shut. It is still night, and the night has brought with it a bitter cold. The servants of the high priest have lit a fire to warm themselves. Peter sits with them. There is no way he would be allowed to go into the room where they lay, led Jesus. Every now and then a servant comes out, and they learn what is happening inside. Jesus does not answer anything they ask him. This makes Caiaphas furious. How can he sentence him to death without proof? Especially because they must convince Pilate, the Roman governor, who must agree to the death sentence. Caiaphas gets up. He's in a frenzy. He yells at him. I ask you to swear. I ask you to swear before the living God. Tell us, are you or are you not the Christ, the Son of our God? Jesus said, I am. Soon you will see the Son of Man in all the glory of God. That is what Caiaphas was waiting to hear. He takes both his hands and rips his cloak in two. What further proof do we need? He cries out. You all heard him. This is blasphemy. He is presenting himself as the Son of our Holy God. Well, what do you say? They all say, he must be put to death. It is death, therefore. This is the decision of the high priests. Judas learns of their decision and rushes to where they have gathered. He is extremely upset and throws down the purse with the thirty pieces of silver. I have sinned, he says with regret. I am sending an innocent man to his death. I have sinned, he says with regret. I am sending an innocent man to death. So why are you telling us? The high priests speak to him with scorn. That is your problem. This only makes Judas's pain all the greater. In desperation, he runs out of the city to the wilderness. Meanwhile, the high priests take Jesus from the meeting room of the Sanhedrin. They leave him by the entrance with the servants. When morning comes, they will take him to Pilate, that he may approve their decision. Down in the courtyard, Peter has not yet learnt of the conviction of Jesus. Peter cannot conceal his impatience. It has been a while since one of the servants came out to say what was happening inside. He speaks abruptly to those around him. He answers questions in a rambling and absent-minded way. Just then, a servant girl comes, giggling. She tells them what is happening at the entrance. The servants have already blindfolded Jesus. Some are spitting at him. Others are hitting him. Then they ask him to say who hit him and who spat on him. Peter is shaken. The servant girl laughs all the more. She asks, are you one of his disciples? Peter denies it. The others who were warming themselves by the fire with him are giggling. He is, he is. Can you not tell by his accent? He speaks like someone from Galilee. An officer passing by the courtyard stops and takes a good look at Peter. He was with Malchus when Peter drew his sword. I saw you, he says. You were with him last night, were you not? Why do you deny it? Peter curses and swears an oath that he does not know the man. Before he can even finish this oath, he hears a cock crowing in the distance. Then he remembers his master's words. Peter, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter goes out from the courtyard, covers his faith with the palm of his hands, and he cries. Sobbing, he cries his heart out. At the break of dawn, Jesus is taken from the house of Caiaphas. He is taken to the Praetorium, the place of judgment, to Pontius Pilate. The high priests and the other Jews do not enter. Their religion forbids it because Pilate is a Gentile, not Jewish. If they were to enter the house of a Gentile, they would not be able to eat all day, that is, until evening. They also would not be able to sacrifice at the altar. Therefore, they remain in the courtyard. 
Pilate comes out to the terrace and asks them what charges they have against Jesus. The high priests look at each other. They were not expecting him to ask that question in public. He knows what the charge is. Anyway, they repeat the same things. He does not respect the laws of Moses. And most important, he calls himself king of the Jews. They cry out to Pilate, We have a king. He is Caesar. Pilate looks at Jesus with pity. The tortures of the servants of Caiaphas left deep scars on his forehead and cheeks. They have settled in his eyes like deep pain. He remains silent and his eyes are lowered. Are you really a king? Pilate asks him, but not in a mocking way. Jesus therefore answers him. My kingdom is not of this world, he assures him. If it were of this world, my people would have come to defend me. Pilate is amazed at how peaceful Jesus is, how calm. His answers are well thought out and of few words. They prove his innocence. The screaming of the high priests and the prejudice of the mob give him the opposite impression. It appears they want to condemn an innocent man. Because Pilate can find no fault with the accused, and in order to get rid of them, he sends them to Herod for judgment. Herod is the tetrarch, like a governor, of Galilee. He is therefore the more proper person to judge someone from Galilee. Herod was happy that Pilate regarded him so highly. No matter what the accusers of Jesus said, they could not convince Herod of his guilt. Also, Jesus did not defend himself. He answered nothing. To mock him, to have some fun at his expense, Herod puts a royal cloak on him. Then he sends him to Pilate. Pilate did not find this amusing. He thought it a bit crude. He believed Jesus was innocent. He tries, therefore, to find a way for him to escape the sentence of death. He also, however, does not want to openly clash with the high priests. He remembers that during the Passover holidays, he has, as governor, the right to release a prisoner. His thoughts go to Barabbas. Barabbas was a thief and a murderer. While he was free, he was the cause of fear and terror for any traveler. When his Roman pursuers captured him and put him in prison, the people breathed easier. They were relieved. Pilate, therefore, comes out to the terrace. It was his custom for him to ask the high priests, who are gathered below, in the courtyard of the praetorium, whom they want released. Do they want Jesus or Barabbas? Barabbas! they all yelled out with one voice. Barabbas! cries the crowd that has been stirred up by their leaders. Have they forgotten so quickly how many people Barabbas murdered just to steal their money? Have they forgotten how dangerous it was to come in and out of Jerusalem when that criminal was loose? What about Jesus? What should I do with Jesus? Pilate does not conceal his disappointment. Crucify him! They all yell from down below. But why? What evil has he done? No one is listening to Pilate. They cry out all the more, Crucify him! Crucify him! These people who are now asking that he be condemned are the very ones who but a few days earlier were welcoming him into Jerusalem with palms. They were the very ones whose own people were healed by his hands. Jesus does not speak. He makes no effort to defend himself even when he has the opportunity, not even when Pilate pleads with him to do so. Do you not understand, he threatens? It is up to me whether you live or die. Calmly, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me except for that which was given to you by my Father. The words of Jesus are drowned out by the mob that is demanding his crucifixion. They threaten Pilate that if he does not crucify him, then he is no friend of Caesar's. This means that Pilate could be removed from his position. 
he could lose his high office. He asks for a basin of water, which was brought to him. He washes his hands in front of all the high priests and the mob crying for Jesus to be crucified. He says, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. Let this sin be upon you. Without another word, he frees Barabbas. He orders that Jesus be whipped. Then he gives him over to be crucified. The people are in a festive mood. They are celebrating the decision by Pilate to crucify Christ. Can you imagine that? They want to crucify the Messiah, their Messiah. We do not want that kind of Messiah, they cried out. They believe their Messiah will come to liberate them. That is how they are thinking. They want someone who will free them from the Romans' yoke, so that they can live in freedom. They want to be the chosen ones. They are having fun, along with the soldiers, who now put Christ in royal cloak given by Herod. They laugh upon seeing the crown of thorns placed on his head. In his hands they have given him a reed to hold as though it were his kingly scepter. Then, one by one, they kneel down before him, mocking him, making fun of him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! No, their Messiah would never allow himself to be laughing stock of the lowest servant. Within the hour, four men bring the cross. It weighs down Jesus. The cross is heavy, almost impossible to lift. After all the suffering Jesus has gone through, first with the servants in the courtyard of the high priest, then with the soldiers in the praetorium, how can he now carry the cross? It is so heavy that he stumbles, he falls. The soldiers force him to get up. They swear at him for saying that he could destroy the temple and in three days rebuild it. Now they are saying, if he cannot even lift the cross, how is he going to rebuild the temple? After a while, when he again falls, they begin kicking him. A stranger, Simon of Cyrene, who happens to be passing by, sees the soldiers kicking him. He cannot hide either his displeasure or his pity. What a shame, he says, and hurries to go away. The soldiers stop him, however, and they force him to carry the cross of Jesus to Golgotha. Everything thereafter is done according to the rules and the laws of Rome. By now it's almost noon. Jesus has been nailed to the cross. He is between two thieves. The soldiers below are dividing his garments. However, they do not know how to divide his cloak. They do not have the heart to tear it into pieces, one for each of them. In any event, tearing it to pieces would make it worthless. They decide to cast lots and draw for it. They have been so busy they have just about forgotten Jesus. They become startled when they hear his pained voice cry out, I thirst. They get up and quickly tie a sponge on the reed with a short while ago they had given him for a scepter. They dip it into a pot of vinegar kept to be given to the condemned to dull their senses. They put it to his lips. They poke fun at him, saying, Here you are, fresh water from the well. Drink to satisfy your thirst. The two thieves on either side of him are swearing and cursing. As a matter of fact, one of them starts blaming Jesus. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other thief, scolds him. Do you not fear God? We are paying for our deeds, but they say he only did good. He glances towards Jesus with a pleading look. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Truly I say to you, Jesus assures him, you will be with me in paradise from this very day. The soldiers break out into new laughter and ridicule. If you are God, then come down from that cross, and we will believe in you. Jesus is not listening. He is praying. He is asking God to forgive them, 
to forgive those who crucified him. He excuses them by saying, they do not know what they do. Afterwards, he casts a loving glance at his mother. The women who followed Jesus from Galilee are there to support her. John, his beloved disciple, is with them. To give his mother courage, he tells her, From now on, he will be your son. His eyes look for John, and then he adds, She will be your mother. From that moment on, the beloved disciple took her to his home. Then something unbelievably astounding happens. Suddenly, the sun is hidden from view. The earth is cast into darkness. The sky seems to have lowered. All the people who have gone up to Golgotha to be amused by the crucifixion are now full of fear. They run to return to the city. Alas, alas, woe be to us, they cry out. The women are pulling their hair. Woe be to us, we have crucified an innocent man. Jesus cries out in agony, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The soldiers, their curiosity aroused, raise their hands. They look at him. They think he is calling Elijah. Let us see, they ask each other. Will Elijah come to help him, to save him? While they were waiting to see if Elijah will come, Jesus, with a loud voice, says, It is finished. His work and mission on earth is now finished. It has ended with his death on the cross. The Passover was dawning. Jesus was still upon the cross. He had died. No, he cannot be left there on such a day, on such a great holiday. A council member, Joseph, from Arimathea, a disciple, a secret disciple of Jesus, along with Nicodemus, also a secret disciple, request and receive from Pilate permission to take the body of Jesus. They wish to take it down from the cross for burial. Tenderly, they anoint the body with scented oils and perfumes, as was the custom. These precious perfumes were costly, as was fitting for the burial of God. Then they wrapped it in a fine linen sheet. They hastened to place the body in the tomb as quick as possible, for it is getting dark. The tomb belongs to Joseph. It was carved out of rock. It was near Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. They seal the entrance to the tomb with a huge rock, too heavy to lift. Then they leave. Before they have gone very far, they see four soldiers coming. Surely they have been sent either by Pilate or the high priest to guard the body. The high priests are afraid that maybe the disciples will steal the body and later say that he is resurrected. In their minds, that would be even a greater deception. It would be greater than the first, which was that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. For me to your long suffering, O Lord. Hearing the story of Christ's crucifixion is very important for all of us. We need to know that Jesus willingly went on the cross and suffered and died for us. Because you can't get to Easter without first going through the cross. Jesus suffered and died for us so that he could enter into our weakest, our worst spots, into death for us. But from the lowest spots, he's able to lift us up and carry us up to his Father. So, even though this is a very sad story, let's know that in three days, he will rise from the dead. So we know the ending. God loves us and he lifts us up. So now is the time where you guys get to participate a little bit more. I'm hoping that you will have printed or drawn a picture of Jesus who is laying down dead. And what we're going to do is we're going to carry this special shroud that you have made around just like Joseph of Arimathea did. We're going to carry this shroud maybe around your kitchen table, maybe around your whole house. 
You decide how you can do it. Maybe it's just up and down your hallway. But carry Christ. Be with Joseph, who took Jesus' body, carried him, and laid him in the table. You can place your picture of Jesus on your table that you have in front of you too. I have here with me a pretty big picture. I had to use my printer and I printed it on lots of papers, but you can use just one sheet. This picture of Jesus being placed in the tomb, well, that's what we're doing right now. We are participating in the carrying and the placing of Christ in the tomb. So, as I sing with my family, you can carry the shroud of Christ. Oh, no. No. And just like I did, now is the time where we can kiss Jesus' boobas. On your picture of Jesus, he probably has boobas or injuries on his hands and his feet and in his side, just like we heard in the gospel. So feel free to kiss those boobas better so that our God can rise again with comfort. Now, the final part of this little service is going to be the hymn of Simeon to ask God to let us go, let us go forth in peace, and to think and to pray about him. So let's sing the hymn of Simeon. Now you shall dismiss, dismiss your servants, O Lord, according to your word in peace, because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared for the face of all peoples, a light to revelation of the Gentiles, and the glory of your people is May the blessing of the Lord be upon you with his grace and love for mankind, now and always and forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to you, O Christ our God, our hope. Glory be to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Give the blessing. May Christ, our true God, who was crucified and buried for our salvation, through the prayers of his Immaculate Mother and of all the saints, will he have mercy on us and save us, for he is good and he loves all of us. Amen. I wish all of you to have a lovely rest of your day. If it's the morning, have a beautiful day. If it's the evening, have a beautiful night. But make sure that you at least keep Jesus on your heart. Keep thinking about all that he has done for us. Blessings upon you and your family. And we'll see you in a couple days for the resurrectional service. That's where Jesus comes back to life and we get to celebrate and sing the words that we all want to sing. I'll see you in a couple days.